am Af Malhotra and this is Straight Talk. I'm absolutely delighted to kick off the second episode in season three with an incredible person, an exciting individual, an accomplished executive. I'd like to welcome Niall Jones from L'Oreal. She is the VP of People Development. And one of the reasons she's on the show today is because uh, Niall has got not only an extensive um, pedigree in people, in human resources, in understanding culture, she is also campaigning and championing the entire domain of diversity. To, to that end, she has been interviewing, like I, like I am right now, she's been interviewing executives who have uh, sort of made a mark in this domain and have shared personal stories with her as to what happens after you crack through the glass seal. And I will talk about that with Niall today. Without further ado, Niall, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for coming on Straight Talk. We're going to have uh, an electric 60 minutes talking about a lot of things uh, in a straight talking way. So welcome to the show. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I very much appreciate this conversation. It's near and dear to my heart. So happy to have an open and honest conversation with you today. Wonderful. So I folded folded my my hands and um, my sincere apologies if I say something that's out of place with a greater humility. I just want to ensure that we have a really meaningful conversation about a topic that is close to your heart and certainly close to my heart. And we both care about this tons. So I'm going to kick off and start with the most important question, which relates to you. And if you could just give us a whistle stop tour of who you are and why um, this topic and this issue is so close to your heart. Um, and please feel free to be as direct as possible. And then we'll start opening up the, the Pandora's box and we'll travel around and see where we end up. So uh, sure. who, who are you? What do you do? How have you got here and why does diversity matter to you? Absolutely. So um, Nail Jones, as you know, I have been working now in marketing and advertising for about almost 22 years. So I, I started right out of college in the advertising agency, spent the majority of my career there and then moved on to what we call like the client side. So I left the agency world and moved direct to manufacturers and helping them directly reach out to consumers. Um, I would say that's a lot of where my passion for diversity, equity, and inclusion started. Um, I, I started really from the point of nobody really gets how to talk to beyond the general audience. And a lot of coming from the agency side was, let's just talk to the general audience. Let's just do this. And everyone will put it on ABC and everyone will see it because it has such a wide audience without the the focus on nuance and does it make sense? And does this really resonate with others? Is it maybe a little bit inappropriate? Uh, really, that's where it started. But I always felt as though I could not really speak up <laughs> and it wasn't a moment of, all right, this is what we have to do. This is what the client wants. Let's just move forward. Fast forward about, ooh, I would say 15 years. And I, I like to say that as I got older, I kind of just had less fucks to give and said, you know what, I'm going to be open and honest. And uh, in 2018, I gave a TEDx talk around really taking the moment to the fact that diversity, diversity isn't a trend. And we need to really think and focus on how are we activating this both from the perspective of reaching consumers and also how are we supporting, you know, people of color, women, LGBTQ plus IA, people with disabilities in what we do internally. Mm -hmm. And it kind of lit a fire for me to say, okay, I have a seat at the table. I'm not just going to sit here and protect my place, but I'm going to try to shake it up. And that's really where I've been since then. I, I've been very vocal, very open, making sure I'm reaching out to the right people, bringing those other voices inside. And saying, how do we really just have some open, honest conversations? Fantastic. So you've been entrenched in this. You care about it immensely. Let's first start with 
the real issue at hand. So I'm going to fast forward all of the noise, get cut through all the noise. You're not going to find this on this show, so we're going to go right. right. Into it, right? So diversity is thankfully being discussed a lot more. I think globally in every market, so we feel like actually there is someone listening. And the fact that we're having this conversation today and it's going to be marketed and promoted and hopefully a lot of people will watch it and feel inspired or engaged is a positive step, a step in the right direction, okay? At the same time, there'll be a lot of skeptics here who say, well, that's fine, but are we really making the sort of progress that we truly want to make? You know, I was speaking to someone recently who was narrating a, a story uh, from a corporate career here in the UK, actually, someone who is a um, um, person of color, as they say in the US, or a person who comes from an ethnic minority, as we say in the UK, and a very successful executive who was narrating a story of how they uh, had to uh, essentially sue the company they worked for, um, for racial discrimination after many, many, many years of success. And it was a terrible story because this person's career, which was illustrious and long with great friendships and so on, had to come to a terrible end. And it was a sour uh, end to something that uh, could have been amazing and fantastic. And you know, I asked this person, was it just because you had one bad apple? And he, he said to me, it was a he, he said, no, it was something that was going on for a long time. It was systemic, it was institutional. I just had the courage to do something with it and uh, take a bold step. Yeah. And so it got me thinking about, you know, progress. And this is 20, 25 years ago, or whatever it may be. And according to this person, he was delighted that it's being discussed and their movements and their hashtags and it's all over social media. But actually, have we made a material difference? And so my question to you really is, and of course, you're providing a viewpoint from the United States. You work uh -huh. for a company. Uh, that um, you have a role in and you are in the US and that's your perspective. And I, I want to touch on something really important, if I may. Sure. And I, felt, you know, I first want to say a few things. First, I want to say that diversity at its very basic level is about race and gender. I think of it, I almost think of it as a um, iceberg. And I think, well, the basic stuff that you can see, very low levels of maturity is we talk about race and we talk about the color you are. And yep. then we talk about gender. You know, are there loads of women? Yes. Are there people of uh, from different sort of races and color, you know, color and backgrounds? Yeah, yeah fantastic. But actually, diversity means a lot more. It and does. And there's this issue of discrimination and prejudice and preconceived biases that is not only about race. Okay. So we'll we'll tackle that a little bit later if that's okay. But first, I want to just deal with an important point, which is that um, certain races I feel have been marginalized more than other races. I'm just calling this out right now mm -hmm. because I do believe it deserves to be called out. I think, you know, if I come from an Indian background, so, you know, call me brown, if you want to call it with for those who, who want to put right. a, a, a label <laughs> as a color. And I think, you know, when I think about um, what I've been doing in the United Kingdom, I've been in corporates for many years and worked for American companies and British companies. I think, you know, people who are uh, from Indian backgrounds have had it tough. Uh, and have to work really hard and have to prove themselves and they they face a different sort of bias, mm -hmm. you know, bias in terms of uh, where they come from in India, their accent, their caste, sometimes even from other Indians, for, for you know, um, for example, it's yeah. not always the, uh, the other color. And so there is prejudice and bias in, in that way and there's discrimination, absolutely. Throughout my career, though, I have felt that there's been a scarcity of people from the Afro-Caribbean community, as we call it here, or African-American mm -hmm. community or people were black essentially and i do think that as as far as i'm concerned it's tough for everyone but i think the the uh, my friends who are from from uh, you know who are black who are from that community in the uk have struggled much more than i have you know i have struggled absolutely but i it's a different ball game mm -hmm. and i don't think much has moved the needle hasn't really moved i've got to be honest with you um i don't the last company i worked for and i won't name them which is a corporation there was no one, a few Indians floating around, a few people are brown um, and, and a few other colors floating around and people from different backgrounds. Not many, not many people from the um, Afro-Caribbean background or who are black, not at all. And I don't think that's changed much. And there are loads of stories and arguments Well, it's about the funnel, there are not enough people from school going in, all that sort of good stuff. But I, I'm raising that with you um, 
because I just want to talk about real things. Yep. So tell me a bit about what your view is with this. And and I want to, I don't want to be negative. I don't want to be uh, pessimistic or cynical. But let's just let's have a real conversation like you're sitting here in my living room. Sure. But what do you think about what I'm saying? I would agree with you. I think that there are, you know, I, I've had several conversations with people who sit in the diversity, equity, inclusion space. And the one thing that always comes up is if you have a brain, you have a bias. So all of us have some forms of biases to, to no matter what it is, positive, negative, whatever it may be. And I do feel that in terms of from a systemic perspective, there is already a preconceived bias when it comes to uh, to each differing ethnic group, no matter where you are, especially in the US. So I do think that there's a huge opportunity where there's, uh, let's really think about, well, did this person come from the right background? Do they have the right access? Did they go to the right school? Do, you know, it, it, it depends and it really feels like there's, there is a, um, you know, a, a stop gap that happens when it comes to much more, I would say in the US, definitely when it comes to black people in the US specifically, because I can only speak from my experience being here. But also I would say from for Brown as well, depending on what background you're from. So if you're looking at people who are Hispanic or Latin descent, we have some of the same situations and the same issues. And a lot of that comes from, yes, the bias of uh, I don't know, or the, the positive bias in the other way, because you think about things like nepotism and we went to the same school and so on and so forth. But because of the way the U.S. has been set up, because of socioeconomic issues, you have less opportunity for those that fall below that line um, and really don't have the opportunity to get in the door to then be moving up the ladder. So once you get to much more of the senior levels, how do you get there? I recognize that even in the perspective of you know, my, you know, my ethnicity, because I'm African American descent, you know, came from my ancestors were enslaved Africans. That's where I came from. I'm, I'm not, I'm not an immigrant. But I also know that I come from a sense of privilege because I grew up, I am not the first college graduate in my in my family. I was second, third generation. So it, you know, having that background of being able to kind of come up, I had more opportunities than most of the other people I know. I know so many people who are Black, African-American, who are first generation college graduates. And so they don't have the network that allows them to get there. And, you know, and, you know coming from that, how many live below the poverty line, how many are in different different jobs and sitting in opportunities that are not necessarily deemed corporate America or appropriate for corporate America does have that hindrance when you get to the door and you want to move beyond. There's that bias level of you didn't go to the right school. You don't know the right people. You just submitted a resume through LinkedIn. Okay, great. There's name bias still in terms of I'm not sure if that's something I want or I don't think that's the right person. So it really does create, I would say, potholes is actually the right way to say it, of trying to get on that road and move. So how are you swerving around them just because of your background, who you know or don't know, uh, who you have access or don't have access to. And it, it becomes even worse the higher up the ladder you go. Uh, there is, and, and there's just a dearth of, of that opportunity to be able to say, eh, do I wanna talk? Do I wanna do this? And and do I want to have conversations? Because I know this person, this person's great and fits in really well with my team, but I don't want to take the moment to kind of step back and say, here's somebody else that I need to talk to, or I really need to take more time. Um, I have seen, being completely honest, I've seen some really good things in at least the marketing industry recently and more efforts in the US to really start thinking about how do we diversify our candidate pool? How do we reach out and look at other people? How do we make sure we're expanding the schools we visit when we talk about management trainee programs? Um, how are we really reaching out and providing the right opportunity for people to come into the organization? But that's where I think it stops. 
Um, I, I, I'm not seeing then once you get in, are you creating the right environment so that people stay? And I think that's been a big issue, um, whether it's on the part of the person coming in, the, you know, the person, the black person coming in or the Hispanic person coming in, or whether it's on part of the manager and the culture of the organization you're going into, it's tough. I mean, you look at Google, um, who spent so much money and continues to push and do so much around trying to recruit more diverse candidates, especially black candidates, and their retention of them is horrible yeah. because people keep saying, you know, I, yes, I've come in, it's great. I don't feel like I'm welcome here, so I'm leaving. And I think that's also an issue that happens, especially among uh, Black Americans, you know, or, or Black immigrants in the U.S. when they're coming into certain high level positions or certain corporate positions, they get there and they don't feel welcome or they feel like an other. They feel like an other. And it creates another set of anxiety around it. And then you just opt out. So. It's on companies to make sure that people are feeling better and feeling welcome. And that doesn't mean treating them like you put them on a pedestal, but it does mean starting to think about some of those aspects of, uh, does it feel right? Have we addressed maybe some issues? Have we thought about things? Have we created the right environment where everybody feels like, oh, okay, I can be myself here? Or, or are we seeing a pattern because so many people are leaving and they're wearing a mask? And then, of course, at the end of the day, people are afraid to say, oh, here, let me put in my exit interview how I really feel. Nobody's doing that. <laughs> so that doesn't happen either. So tell me a little bit more about it, if, if you don't mind. When you say you give the Google example, and we're not going to pick on Google, but generally speaking. No, just general. Time. And they're not yeah. alone. Yeah, of course. When you say they, they don't feel right, can you just break that down for me? What do you mean by they don't feel right? What happens? So there's so many. Um, and then I have several friends and, and several, uh, you know, former colleagues and, and people who have been in other tech organizations or corporate organizations. And a lot of things in terms of what people say is, uh, I find it hard to find a sponsor. I I'm not comfortable speaking to different levels of, of people in the organization. No one has offered to come and say, hey, welcome, come do this. Or I feel, I don't feel welcome at company events. I don't feel, you know, people go out and have drinks, I'm never invited. Or, uh, you know, there are those moments that are things that feel, that probably aren't directed and, or purposefully felt like I'm not part of it or I'm not the one to do it, but it still can build and build and build. And then you go deeper where conversations that happen on internal Slack channels and internal public forums, where it can venture into, uh, do they have a right to be here? Pressure against affirmative action policies and do we need one? And, and or really being treated and in some in some ways being spoken to as if you're you're just a diversity hire. So if and so that coming in as oh, I already have the team I'm coming into already has a preconceived vision of me as a diversity hire that I don't belong here. I don't. I don't have the uh, you know the skills or the technical background to be here, but I'm here just because of my race, just because of my skin color, just because I tick a box. And that feeling is it, it's a lot, and it creates stress. It creates anxiety. You're already now in the you've put yourself and you feel like you've walked into a situation where. I got the job, which should say I've proven myself, but now I have to prove myself to a bunch of people, not just the people who hired me. Uh, and that can be a whole other thing and a whole other mental toll that, that you know, people can take on. And I've been there where I've been the only one in the room. And that's a hard place to be, especially if you're the only woman and the only Black person doubly, you know, having a double situation in a room full of white men. And I've been there time and time and time again. And that across my career from especially when my agency days, 
And that's a hard place to be. I, I will be an honest in saying I've been lucky that I've never felt like, oh, I'm there just because of my face and the, and the image that I portray. Right. Now, at the time, that wasn't the thing to do. So, you know, it was, it, I think it might be a little bit different now. And I remember having times where, oh, let's put you in this, you know, new business proposal just because literally I am female and black. <laughs> so I, I check a box and I show diversity. Um, and I, I think that was, you know, it feels really hard and it feels like what am I here is just a token. And if I am here is just a token, is that the right thing to do? And I've heard that from so many, especially when you get to senior leaders and, you know, and you, and you speak to other, you know, black women or Hispanic women or, or sometimes Asian women as well. And conversations I've had, it's like, am I the token? And am I here just because of that? Am I treated because that way? Am I being trotted out <laughs> to say, look, we're diverse. And then that doesn't feel good either. I, I think on the flip side, it's the reward and recognition thought process when you think from, you know, traditional HR thought process of, well, let's reward them, let's recognize them, let's set them up for rewards. But at the end of the day, it's like, yeah, do you really believe this or is this a PR play for you, not for me? That's a great point. Thank you for, thank you for being so honest and mm -hmm. uh, direct because I think it's important to tackle these issues. It reminds me of uh, another, another side to this is Indra Nui, who was the CEO of Pepsi, uh, an Indian woman, mm -hmm. for many, many, many years. In fact, she's now retired and written a book that's um, that's getting you know a wave of reviews and stuff. I guess there's there, there's so many sides to this right, in terms of um, trying to get it right. Now, let me be a little bit more compassionate and empathetic towards the leaders who are trying to get this right, because there are some who do want to do the right thing and they feel a moral obligation and an ethical obligation to keep harmony and to keep things fair and meritocratic as much as possible. Mm -hmm. How does one get this right, though, is the big question. I mean, we're sitting here having this debate and we can have we can spend three hours having a conversation yes. about you know, the, the horrible feeling and the shitty experience that you have when yeah. you're the only one in the room and the subtle racism and prejudice. And gosh, you know, I think we should, by the way, I think it's important to let people who are not in our position know that that action and that statement or that missed spelling or that, um, uh, you know, job title that was incorrect. Gosh, and you're shaking your head because I've been there as well. Mm -hmm. Or that's not what I actually said. That quote was the other guy who's brown as well. Oh, right. So it wasn't you. No, it's the, you know, it's the, the other one. one. Yeah. No, one that's, that's not me. Yeah. So it's fine. You laugh it off. You know, you laugh it off. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way to move forward. Hopefully that'll get better one day. But what, what would we do and what do we say to those who are trying to say, well, I, uh, now I get this, half I get it. So what should I do? Like, right. What do you want me to do? I always, I always say there are three things and three ways to look at it. One, ask questions. Ask your people. Talk to them. We, and many are open and willing to talk and afraid to do it because they're afraid of, of retribution. They're afraid of things. But if you openly come to someone and say, I really want to understand, how are you feeling? What's working? What should we start? What should we stop? What should we continue if you want to use that language? And if you come into someone out of a, a feeling of, I'm genuinely asking you, People will tell you, either you can tell, you can always tell when someone's asking you a question out of bias or out of ill intent. You can tell good intentions when someone's going to ask you questions. Ask questions. <laughs> there you go. And then you know, ask your people. You have a whole organization of people. Ask them how they're feeling. And then the second is when they, when they tell you, listen to them. Don't take the step back and go, okay, I asked you, great, thank you, put it in a file, great, we did some interviews, we did some focus groups, here's the report, and then never do anything with it. Listen to what they say, go back and have a conversation around, is this, do we think this is right? Even if you are working really hard, how people perceive what's going on is is some data that you can have on, oh, okay, I've done this. I thought it was resonating this way. It's not, but you're not going to know if you don't ask and you're not going to know if you don't listen to people. And then, you know, it's, I think that between that is 
how then do you take those two pieces and then actually have some actions around it? How are you going to come back and say, we heard you, here's the action plan now for us to really think about what do we want to do with it? We can't do everything, but we hear you that this piece we thought was right is not right. There's so many conversations that are happening, at least in amongst, you know, diversity enthusiasts, practitioners and, um, you know, and, and just people, consultants in the industry, McKinsey, Harvard Business Review is doing it, that Black people in corporate America are over mentored and under sponsored. So great. We want to help and we want to support. Let's throw more mentors at them. I have 10 mentors. I don't need another one. You know, I have people in business and people outside. I've been working for 22 years. I don't need a mentor. I need someone who's going to sponsor me to the upper level, sponsor the work that I'm doing and make sure that I'm my voice is in the room when I'm not there. And that's what tends to happen. And people don't always say those things and you're not realizing. So it's the first thing is let's do a mentor program or if it's external, let's do an incubator where we're going to donate and help people get access to things. And it's, I don't need access to people to help me figure out my business. I need access to capital, (laughs) access to money. Those are the things I need. How are you doing that? So really taking the moment to sit back and have a conversation, ask the questions, even if it's uncomfortable, ask the question anyway. Uh, As I said, if it's ill intent, you can tell, but if you genuinely want to know, people can tell that as well. Listen to the answer and then try to figure out how you can make some actions to change it. I I think that's the easiest thing to do. I think we automatically go, and if you don't feel comfortable doing it, then hire somebody to do it. <laughs> go, and there's so many people who can come in and say, well, let us let us have some conversations. Let's do some listening circles. Let's figure that out. Let's bring back to you what your people think. And do it not just for this one group, because we want to satisfy, you know, we want to make sure that we're retained in the great resignation, whatever it is, and we want to retain people of color. Let's only talk to them. Talk to everybody. Because then that also helps you to understand what the rest of the organization is thinking, because you don't want to then overcorrect and alienate other people. So it, it's really conversations of how are we, how are we thinking, how are we talking, how are we listening, and how are we acting? It's a simple enough. It's, it's the same thing sometimes that you would do if you're advertising something. You don't just put a product out and go, great, here it is. Don't you want to buy it? unless you're a celebrity and then you can use your celebrity cap, you know, capital to kind of push people, but you do market research and you figure it out. And then you say, okay, great. Here's what I want to, here's what people are looking for. And now I've created a product. I've adjusted it. I've optimized it and I put it on the market. Do the same for your people. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Yeah. So I like the, I like all of it. The last bit is an interesting one where you're saying, and we often forget that the practices that we use to generate revenue and top line and growth uh, should actually be repackaged and used internally and maybe they'll have the same effect or even a, a more significant effect absolutely i always say it's you know people like to think about the products and the business is like the people if you don't have the right people in your organization and you aren't treating your people right in your organization that's not going to help your bottom line either and in the vein of we are in a social media world and where people are always on the next thing, talking about what's going to happen. It is very easy for a consumer to say, I like your product, but you treat your people like crap and I don't want to buy it. And it happens more and more, especially in the U.S. It's huge. There's so many whistleblower Instagram and Twitter accounts and so many things that happen. And, you know, people talk about cancel culture. And I do agree. Sometimes it gets a bit out of hand um, or a lot out of hand. But there are always consequences to actions. But at the same time, it's very easy for me as a consumer to say, oh, I love this. How do they treat their people? (laughs) What's going on? And I remember, oh God, I'm really aging myself. I remember the way that started and it was a Twitter account many, many years ago and it was in the elevator at Condé. And it was someone who was at Condé Nast around the time and they were just tweeting things that they heard in the elevator. And And that was the first time where people were like, behind the scenes, this is what's happening. So you know the people side and the corporate side of the things that you're buying. 
And that is so much more prevalent today with things like Estee Laundry and, um, you know, and uh, diet Prada and other things where they're talking beyond just the, here's the products, don't you want to buy it? Or, or, you know, consumer reports about this product doesn't work, but talking about how the company acts how the groups are, how they're reacting to their people, how they're treating their people. It's a whole huge thing. And it's something that, you know, consumers bet their dollars on, especially younger consumers bet their dollars on just as much as, do I like the product? Fascinating. Let's move um, to another direction, which is the role that you're doing right now, as in, you know, you're focused on people development. Uh, That's a vast spectrum of things that you do to develop people. And you touched on one of the points, not that I'm trying to go after a fad. You talked about the great resignation. And in some parts of the world, you know, I was talking to someone out of India. He was referring to it as the great reshuffle. And so in every market, the manifestation, the um, signals, the behaviors post-pandemic, during and post-pandemic, have been different based on, you know, the, um, the, the response of that particular market. So let's look at your industry and you don't have to name any companies, but let's look at, you know, the consumer goods industry for a moment, which is quite a fascinating industry because you're talking about Twitter and you're talking about social media and you're talking about almost you being an employee of a company that is a consumer goods company, but also the user, the customer of the product, let's just say, right? Absolutely. So, and you have those two very interesting dimensions. And I guess anyone who has a DTC, like a direct to consumer business is probably thinking this constantly Absolutely. My, my staff is actually a consumer of my product and, and vice versa <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> so tell me a bit about how you see this phenomena of the great resignation or the great reshuffle uh, is that affecting your industry if so to what extent and what if, if not so then what are you seeing as being the the, the sort of post aftermath of covid aftermath of the pandemic oh boy i think there's so many things and it's it's hard to pinpoint exactly what and why. Uh, I, I think, and coming from a personal perspective, going through lockdowns and, and everything that really happened with uh, going through lockdowns and, and really the world shutting down, cities shutting down and having to stay indoors and uh, working from home, et cetera, kids being home really caused a lot of people to take a step back and go, what do I want? What is the life that I want? I've been on, you know, the hamster wheel running the rat race for years. And it was a forced moment to reset. You didn't have a chance to really think about it. And I think that there are a lot of people, especially within, definitely within consumer goods, who are taking the moment to say, what is the type of lifestyle that I want to live? Do I really want to be working, you know, nine to nine every night, being on call on my phone all the time? Do I really want to do that? Um, I'm now present with my kids more than I used to be. I want more of that. Uh, I now have been in my house all the time. I don't like living in the city. I want to move outside and and be in a suburb or have more space or whatever it may be. Then you have those who, and, and that's just from the corporate perspective. Then you have those who are really thinking about, okay, my childcare is, is messed up. I don't have the opportunity to tap into the people that I used to. My kids are home all the time now. I'm trying to do homeschooling. Hopefully we, that will become a, a different thing and we'll get back to some knock on wood sense of normalcy there. Um, and then others who are saying, this is an opportunity for me to really take a step out and do something different. Um, and I think, it, I really think that's what's driving it. And unfortunately, not every company is going to be able to say, this is what we want to do. And this is, we'll try to satisfy everyone. It's not possible. So I do think people are in their mindset rethinking how they want to work. So it's not just about the role I'm playing, the money I'm making, but also the lifestyle I want and does this job allow me the lifestyle I want, which isn't the lifestyles of the rich and famous and the more money and I want a better car and a bigger house and whatever it may be, but it's, I want to be able to be home every night to make dinner. I want to tuck my kids in. I want to be able to work four days a week and now on Fridays be home and do something personal, whatever it may be. 
And people are looking for that. And not every company can, not every company can afford to do it. Not every company is built for that. You know, it, it's really taking the moment to sit back and go, what are the policies we realistically can do? And being okay with saying, we're going to have some, we're going to have some reshuffling. We're going to have some people that are thinking about it. Um, alluding back to the earlier conversation, though, there are also um, some, I would say, you know, people of, of color, again, to use U.S. colloquialism, um, that are using as an opportunity to say, I can do my job <laughs> home personally without having to go into an office and deal with the anxiety that the office means to me. And so I'm now really focusing on, I'd rather find something that is remote full-time rather than having to go into an office in an environment that I don't feel comfortable in. So it allows for that as well. But I really do think it's more a lifestyle choice. And some companies are going to say, all right, great, we're going to completely switch and be hybrid. I, From a personal standpoint, I kind of like being in the office and home. I like the option of going back and forth. I don't want to be 100% either way. Um, and I know there are others who want to be 100% in the office because they're like, I can't work at home. <laughs> My home environment is not conducive to that. And others who are 100%, I want to be remote. I don't want to be in office. I like making my own schedule and working when I need to work and getting shit done on my own. Uh, so I really do think it's people making lifestyle changes, people trying to adjust. We're going to go through that probably for another year or two before things settle out. Mm. And I, I think it's people deciding and figuring out and finding that right opportunity that says, this is, this is good for me in terms of the money I want to make, the career I want to have for myself and my, my ambitions and the lifestyle that I need at this stage in my life. Here's an idea for you, because what you're describing is a level of empowerment for the um, staff, for the employee or the associate. Mm -hmm. uh, and now let's think about training for a second. This is playing my mind when you were talking because the old school training was, well, you're in the office, I'll go get some trainer from somewhere and train you on some, whatever it is that means training on you, get together, have a huddle mm -hmm. in a group for two days. Uh, in the UK, we end up drinking a lot, no matter we just find yeah, out. Yeah, it happens all the time. Yeah, same. Yeah. So whatever training, and then we have, you know, got drunk in the evening or whatever it may be. We'll have coffee. In the oh, that happens here too. <laughs> Much less now that I'm not on the agency side anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, just it doesn't matter here, you know. It's a, it, we, we, uh, you know, pubs. It, we're public. The pub is uh, the meeting place, right? It's right. the meeting place. Yes. <laughs> See, it's um, it's the opposite in the U.S., where it's like you don't go anywhere. Everyone just has a bar in their office. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's very nice. Oh uh, yeah, I mean, the benefits of capitalism, I guess, have to be, uh, exactly. have to be uh, enjoyed somewhere. So here is an idea. So if we operate in a world, be it hybrid or remote or whatever, you know, permutation. Do you think there is a, you can speak for yourself here, do you, do you think there's merit in saying, well, actually, instead of me trying to stuff training down your throat and God forbid, not make it e-learning, you know, or another Zoom call for another, you know, flat screen, as much as we do this here, that's because I haven't got onto the metaverse yet and we haven't got AR VR, because the next time you do the show with me, it will be. It will be in the metaverse. <laughs> Because surely we're all getting bored of this, right? I mean, you know, we've been, I've been doing this for seven, seven years as an entrepreneur, and now my clients do this. And as much as I love that, and it's getting a little bit stale, right? Yeah. So we need a little bit more spice or masala, as they say, you know, in, in the Indian language. So as we seek that, I'm wondering from a people development standpoint, being a leader yourself, do you think you'd be up for having the employee say to you, listen, why don't you give me the money? And um, why don't you allow me, trust me, trust me to use the technology and build my talent. Trust me first to use the cool technologies that are out there and a plethora of courses and so on and so forth. And you can approve what you want or disapprove. It's entirely up to you. And then allow me to build my skills, my talent, my mindset. Do you see any merit in this? And do you think this is ever going to happen? Um, it's a little bit like bring your own device, but this time, yeah. do your own training. Do your own training. A hundred percent, I think that's going to happen. And I've seen it happen. I mean, right. even pre lockdowns and pre like, oh, this is how we do things now. We're on a screen and, and Zoom fatigue. 
smaller tech companies were always doing that, especially ed tech, which was here, we're going to give you a stipend and go do your own development. Now, mind you, that's because they're much smaller startup style companies where they don't have an internal people development or learning and development team. But you start seeing those things and seeing the proliferation of other companies that are out there that are able to say, uh, here's something that can be done. Here are some other opportunities. Here we're bringing multiple people together in a room to thought share and be thought partners and moving things forward. And I 100% think that I you've seen it more on, like you said, the e-learning side where it's go take whatever course you want on LinkedIn Learning or Udemy or whatever it may be. And I think you start to see that. I definitely believe that we'll see more people saying, put your development in your own hands, <laughs> we'll help you get there uh, and, and really help you to understand how, how do you want to grow your expertise. I think I see it a lot more when it comes to if you're an expert um, and you want to build a specific specialty because that's much harder for a corporation to just do so many things for, you know, a smaller group of people um, that are want one specific thing and spending a lot of money just to service, you know, one less than 1% of your population, which means, but I want to support you. So tell me the program, like you said, approve, I'll approve it and go and continue to learn. Um, I also think it helps just from a personal standpoint to be more diverse of thought, be more open and seeing how the industry works, how other people think, getting input from people who are not in your, have the, the blinders of your current company and really are just thinking in, the, uh, in an insular way. So how are you bringing new thought patterns and new thought, new processes internal? You got it. You have to do that. I think that is something that we are, I've started to see, like, I know that there's even companies who've built technology to help corporate corporations be able to, um, to manage something like that, some form of stipend program. Uh, so I continue to think that that will be something that will happen. And that'll be, it won't be a hundred percent, but it will be a part of the benefits package. Right. Right. I want to talk about women, um, women who are pregnant because <clears throat> we're, we're talking about diversity and it's not mm -hmm. always about race and, and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but there's situations, we all go through different situations. Uh, one interesting situation that is, you know, when you have a child and you're a woman, you have a child and we haven't really, um, and I'm a father and I've, uh, I've got two children, so I kind of get it. I, the corporation has just not figured this out uh, generally. Uh, maybe some have in the world, but uh, the minority, the majority don't get it, don't understand it. And the conventions of the past basically say, well, if you're not going to hang around and you're going to be away for a year, year and a half, heck, I could be away for three years because I care about my children. And isn't that a better thing for society so they don't have to grow up and have uh, therapy and CBT yeah. to deal with all the issues when I wasn't there with them? I mean, when I was, good, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, all of that sort of stuff. We know, we know the score. We all know the score. So what do you think needs to be done to support women who have to go and have children for, the, for, for, for society to develop and yeah. for us to have more people and um, for them to um, have the space to be able to feel comfortable and secure and not anxious and stressed that, oh my God, you know, I've lost two years of skills when I go back. Now I've got to go back to the role I was doing two years ago, uh, maybe even lower, but everyone else seems to have moved on just because they didn't have kids. Right. That doesn't, that doesn't sound right to me somehow. Um, it, it doesn't. And, you know, <laughs> I, I don't have kids, so I, I, I have, I haven't had them yet. So I'm, I went, okay. It's, I, I'm speaking as someone who's single, no kids to, to have that conversation. But the truth is having been around so many others who are thinking about, well, how does that impact my career? I'm, I want to have children. Is this the right time? And you have to think about it in the, in the vein of, oh, is it, is it going to hinder my career because I have this ambition? So is now the right time? Should I have done it earlier? Should I do it later because I'm more established? And I think the point of having to think about that feels so wrong to me that you have to think about, 
I'm ready to have kids personally. I'm in the right relationship or, or not. And I've decided, you know, I want to have kids on my own because there are those who decide to, you know, to adopt or do whatever they, they want to because they want to be parents. Um, but I have to think about it in the context of, like you said, is, is it going to take away from my career? Is it going to hinder me? Now I'm going to be out for two years or I'm, I'm going to have to take maternity leave and come back that you have to really think about the presence of, is it going to ruin my career? And it's a hard thing. I remember also so many years ago where it was the thing that was pushed for, oh, well, they went and had kids and they came back right away, or, you know, they came back in two weeks and they, and that wasn't the right thing either. Cause like you said, and then it's, oh, now you've, you created issues for the, you know, for the child. And also not everyone makes enough money to be able to do that and have the right child care or to be able to go back right away. And also from a physical standpoint, that's ridiculous to me because what childbirth does in a woman's body is trauma. <laughs> so to be able to then heal personally, take care of another new brand new human being and then have to go back to work is just, it, it, it boggles the mind for me. I think that if you are and you have been working for some, some, so much time, being able to kind of come back and jump right in and move, it, there's always going to be issues and there's always going to be things that happen. I just wonder why we don't have the same point of view with people who go on medical leave for other reasons, people who mm -hmm. leave for, you know, for cancer treatment or people who have to have some form of emergency surgery, people who, uh, who decide, you know what, I, I just need to take a sabbatical. We don't do doubt or debate those, but we do with women who take extended maternity leave or whatever it may be. Um, and I think that's just a matter of, like putting the business ahead first. It's like, well, the business has to keep going. Yes, the business has to keep going. And you don't want to then over overload the teams that are there beyond to say, okay, this person is not here. So you guys are now going to do all of their work till they get back. Mm -hmm. But really making sure that you have the opportunity for someone to come back into a similar role or have the conversation needs to happen. I also think there needs to be more transparency around how do we make this work? It's so secretive when yeah. someone's doing that and, oh, I want to hide it. I don't want to talk about it. Or I, I just, I'm having this conversation and negotiations behind closed doors. Being able to open that up and say, here's what we're doing. Here's the policy. Let's all have a conversation. And everyone's situation is different. So we're going to have a conversation with each person individually is great. And I, I think that would help in terms of opening doors and, and making it less of a, oh, it's a quiet conversation we don't wanna talk about, which perpetuates the inequality and the issues that we have. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's the same thing around, uh, it is a medical concern, I guess. And people sometimes, especially if there are difficult pregnancies or whatever it may be, it does become much, much more personal. But I think if we're having more conversations around the, the work process and how we can do that, yeah. I think the easier it will be and the less concerned people will, those who are considering or people who now have to think about how they want to navigate a maternity leave or paternity leave or, yeah. uh, or, yeah. or well, adoption. That's important, leave. Too. that's important. Sorry to interrupt. That's yeah. important too. Because heck, you know, the fathers, um, they're pretty good guys as well. I mean, they're not yeah. really, they're fully I fully people. believe they, they want should to spend time that. with their kids too. And, and I think that we've got a, a lot of work to do with, with the dads because, I mean, in the Nordics, I think they've cracked the code. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful system, you know, where you can get a quarter off, months off when you're a father and even longer when you're a mother, because it takes into consideration humanity. And I think this piece about being human and this piece about consciousness is terribly important now. And I, I, it's lovely to see what's happened after COVID, let's be honest. Oh, yeah. So, I know there's some, there's some crappy stuff, but actually in the grand scheme of things, the fact that, that we're more connected to us as people, to our family members, we are, have greater levels of sensitivity. Um, we have a much more, um, you know, profound understanding and appreciation of loss. And if not experience ourselves, we understand the pain that comes from trauma of others. 
Uh, many have suffered it themselves, of course, and they've seen it either themselves or outside of themselves. I think we, we're in a better position. And I think hopefully what I'm trying to get from you, and I think I feel really good about this, is that the mindset of an executive mm -hmm. is changing too. Yeah. Versus two and a half years ago. Would you agree with that? I, I would. Okay. I think from a personal standpoint, I would never have some of the conversations I have with my, my supervisors or my direct reports that I do now, two years ago or three years ago. I'm much more open around, you know, my mental health and my need for, I need a moment or I'm just not, I'm not firing on all cylinders today. Give me some grace and, and also giving myself some grace. Yeah. I don't think I overwork myself today as much as I did in 2019. Yeah. And that's not to say that I don't work my ass off to do what I need to do. I do. But I also think I give myself a little bit more grace to say there is tomorrow <laughs> and you're not your best self if you're, you're not going to actually do the work really well if you're not taking a moment to say, think. I, I literally have a post-it like, like right here on my laptop that says thinking is working. And it, it really reframed me to say, let me take a moment and sit and actually think about how to approach this the right way instead of going, 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 going. And thinking is working. Thinking is working. Thinking is working. I think we're all predisposed by I need to be typing or building a presentation or doing or in a meeting when sometimes you need to take the step back and say, think, think before you act, like think before you move forward. And it's, it's given me the moment to say, slow down a bit and think. Um, it's definitely, I've seen it across the industry with the, the more openness around conversations on mental health and yeah, how are we supporting our employees through that? How are we giving them the, the better resources in that piece of it so that they feel supported and they can take moments and they really can do that? Um, and I've seen a lot more vulnerability as well from leaders to say, it's okay, I'm not perfect either. <laughs> you know, we, we'll, we'll get through it. And not being soft, because I think typically people think, oh, you're just being soft then. So performance must be dipping because no one's really doing their job or, or everyone's too focused on, I need self-care. And that's not the case. It's like you're being held to just as much your performance goals. You, you know, everyone has things that they have to do. Uh, everyone is, you know, you're still seeing performance, company performance and, and reporting on how, how sales are doing, revenue quarterly, et cetera. That's always going to happen. Um, and you're still going to have that push of you have a goal to deliver, deliver it. But the way in which you do it and the manner in which you do it and how you're pushed and how you are given some space and some grace. If you like, I just need five minutes mm -hmm. is happening a lot more. And I I think that's the most positive thing I've seen. Um, I, I think I, it's the it's the best interpretation of. Ooh, post -lock, post lockdown world, <laughs> you know, in, in terms of the way we work, yeah, and exactly. some people do want to go further. Like I said earlier, and I just want to be home, and and I'd rather have the the opportunity to make my own schedule. Where others are just, you know, I just need some mental support. I just need an hour every every Tuesday to go to therapy, which is literally what I I, I told my boss. I'm like, I just ha I have therapy at one p.m. on Tuesdays. That is my time. I have blocked it. I, I blocked the half hour before and half hour after. And that's fine. And building that in and being okay with that. I never would have been okay with that in 2019 or 2018. I'm wow. fine with that. And I'm fine with being open with that as well. Fantastic. And that's, um, that's wonderful. And that's a good way to sort of close. Mm -hmm. I believe an hour has gone by. But before we close, <laughs> I, I just wanted to, I needed your support on something really. Uh, as you know, being at the front and center of this, that this whole domain of acceptance of other people, you know, we call it diversity and all of the other acronyms that we yeah. have. I keep uh, losing, uh, I'm always buying the curve, the new ones, uh, belonging, and equity. Belonging, yeah. Equality, equity, and, and so inclusiveness, and, and that's great. And I'm not being cynical at all. I, I think it's a good thing. 
I think there's one thing that is missing though, which is where I would seek your support and uh, if, if you're open to it, which is that um, I, I cannot find a central place and I, can, I cannot find a central uh, community without any commercial backdrop where the um, e economic argument for diversity is clear cut. I call it diversity economics. This is something I care about and I'm gonna be championing as a not-for-profit um, over the next five years. And what I mean by this is diversity economics is fundamentally dealing with the skeptics that you and I know exist, but we don't talk about them. And I'm not gonna talk about who they are in the demographics, but there are people who are very powerful who run companies and institutions all over the world. For many people, BLM, diversity, all of this stuff is just fads, waste of time, nonsense. Yep. I've heard it firsthand. I'm not throwing my toys out of the pram. What I'm saying is let's try and be empathetic. Let's Absolutely. try and understand where they're coming from and imagine a world where we can actually convince them. And they may not be convinced with the same argument that you and I are so passionate about, so, unfortunately, but they will be con convinced with the argument that is driven by data and numbers and mm -hmm. economic growth and prosperity and all of those good things. The promise of capitalism, the promise of, of uh, wealth and, and all sorts of wealth and, and, and progress. So I'm trying to come to a place where we can gather all of the uh, data, information, case studies, stories, you know, published articles, academic papers in a crowdsourced way in one place. No one owns it in one place. And over the next 12, 24 months and beyond, we start to build a joined up approach to making diversity default as opposed to it being this thing that you do or you don't do, or you do it, you don't do it well enough, or you do it really badly, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. I think it needs to be part of how we exist. And I'll give you a terrible example, and you'll probably hold, hold your head in, in, in um, both your hands, but I'm a, I am love Star Trek, okay? I love Star Trek. I used to watch it I, as I a love kid. Star Trek as well. <laughs> so, and I, used, I used to watch it as a, when I was a kid, and I've been thinking about Star Trek a lot. And why I've been why have I been thinking about it since I've been thinking about diversity or diversity economics, because in Star Trek they were you had the Starship Enterprise and they used to go to these different planets, mm -hmm. okay, um, and discover new civilizations and so on and hang out with those civilizations, you know, Klingons and Ferengis yeah. and Vulcans and so on and so forth. And what I found amazing is that a human, the Homo sapien, like you and me, actually fell in love with a person who didn't look like you and me. Yeah. Like totally didn't look like you. Absolutely. Were, you know, uh, but formed differently, totally different color, out of the convention, like beyond outlier, yes. based on what we know today. And there was a relationship, and they sometimes spoke different languages, surprise, surprise, ate different foods, and there was a bond, there was a belonging, and these civilizations were harmonizing together. Yes. Let's imagine for a moment that's going to happen in, I don't know, 100 years, mm -hmm. whatever the time period is. I think we, I would love that world to exist. And I think we need to do whatever we can for um, the different types of um, influencers and leaders who are enabling and disabling diversity, uh -huh. who are enabling and disabling diversity. We need to take care of the ones who are disabling it as well, because they're not going to change. We can't wait for them to die out. We can, but you know, that's not a yeah. good model. We need to have, we have to relate to them as well. So I would love to get your support um, and your company support and uh, to, to champion this mission. I'm sure you've got so much material and so much evidence to say, listen, we know diversity works and here's the evidence because we're seeing net productivity gains. We're seeing a better working culture. We're seeing our numbers go up. Yeah. Uh, because I think if we can all join forces and have this sort of central place, we can help one another uh, to convince those who don't believe us or need to be convinced a little bit more. So would you be up for, and you don't have to answer it now, but I would love to maybe later <laughs> see if, if you and L'Oreal would like to support this not-for-profit initiative. It's just called Diversity Economics. And it's part of Straight Talk, but it's something that I'm championing here in the UK, but I'd like it to be go global. So uh, I just throw, I thought I'd plug that in, but it's for- <laughs> We should definitely it. talk. I, I think from my perspective is, you know, I sit on so many different, especially industry advisory boards personally. So, yeah. you know, the, the, the Association of National Advertisers here in the US and their, their efforts, which touch 
all so many different corporations and the CM and they have a CMO growth council that's across so many different uh, companies and fortune 500 companies as well, who are all committed to the doing the work. So I, I absolutely would love to have some more conversations because I do think that really thinking about the numbers and how do we make sure that we're telling the story through data is really super important. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. And we will have that conversation. So awesome. as we close off and now, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for being so open and so real and authentic and telling us a lot about your personal journey and your experience. And I think that came across really clearly and uh, giving us the energy that we need because, you know, you're a corporate executive. You're doing extremely well. I'm very proud of the fact that you're doing so well. But actually, you're listening and actually you're talking a lot of sense, which gives all of us a lot of hope. Um, <laughs> and so for that, I'm very grateful. Thank you so much. And we look forward to getting you back on the show at some point in 3D metaverse format. Yes! Yeah.